remember to uh, use this one. Okay. Good evening. My name is Emily Baker and I work here at Hope College as a health professions advisor. I want to welcome you on behalf of Hope College this evening. We at Hope are grateful for this opportunity to come together as a community to discuss a topic that affects all of us in some way. The Your Health Lecture Series is a unique educational partnership between Hope College and Michigan State University College of Human Medicine that has existed for about seven years. The goal of the series is to feature physicians and researchers who can speak on a wide variety of topics of interest to public audiences. We appreciate your attendance here this evening and look forward to learning more about health inequities with you from Dr. Claire Marginson. I would like to now introduce you to Mark Breeby, the Director of Community and Government Relations at Michigan State College of Human Medicine, who helped partner in the coordination of this evening. So thank you, Emily. I, I do want to thank Emily for helping uh, set this all up and uh, making sure we have the rooms and everything we needed. Also, Mary Kay Dobbins, who's not here tonight, has uh, helped, as Emily said, in the seven years that we've been doing this lecture series. So definitely wanted to make sure that uh, I, I acknowledged her help as well. So as Emily mentioned, my name is Mark Breevy. I'm Director of Community and uh, Government Relations at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. I'm originally from Holland, so this is a little bit of a homecoming for me. Uh, really excited to be back home. Um, I did go to that other college in Grand Rapids. We won't talk about that with the Hope College students here, but um, I have a niece here, uh, lots of family that have gone here, both great schools. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, MSU College of Human Medicine and Hope College have been collaborating on the Your Health Lecture Series, like I said, for the past seven years, and that's an extension of the Early Assurance Program Agreement between our two schools. Again, I want to thank Emily and Mary Kay and Hope College for the continuing partnership. I would like to note that at the conclusion of Dr. Mar Margerison's presentation, she will answer questions from the audience, both in person and online, and those that are uh, joining us virtually um, ask that they write their questions in the Q&A feature. With that, I would like to introduce our speaker this evening. Claire Margerison is a population health scientist whose research focuses on understanding the de determinants of racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic inequities in women's health, particularly in and around the pregnancy period. Her work seeks to identify and assess policy cha changes and preventative strategies to eliminate such inequities. Dr. Margerison's uh, current research has two major areas of focus. First, she is assessing the impacts of health and social policies, particular, particularly the Affordable Care Act on women's preconception, preconception health, reproductive health behaviors, pregnancy outcomes, and postpartum health. Second, she is working to produce some of the first empirical evidence documenting the incidence of and disparities in maternal mortality and morbidity due to drug use, self-harm, and violence in the U.S. Dr. Margerison earned her bachelor's degree in biology from Tufts University and an MPH and PhD in epidemiology from the University of California, Berkeley. She completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Texas at Austin in the School of Social Work and the Population Research Center, and she joined the faculty in epidemiology and biostatistics at MSU in August of 2013. With that, Dr. Marge Harrison. Okay, thank you all for uh, being here tonight. Um, this is my first time at Hope College. Um, usually when I come to Holland, I just go to the state park. So it's nice to see something else. And I thank you for the welcome. Um, so I am going to be talking a little bit about some of the topics um, that you just heard about, but um, trying to have kind of more of a general um, presentation that, you know, is of interest to the public and undergraduate students. So um, hopefully you will enjoy it and learn something. Um, so, um, oh, this is going this way. Okay. 
So um, as uh, I was introduced, so you already know that I'm Claire Margerson. I'm an associate professor of epidemiology and biostatistics down the road um, at Michigan State University in our college, college of Human Medicine um, in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. So um, Mark already gave you a little um, information about how I got here, but um, I thought I would just um, give you a little overview of how I got to where I am today, because if you're um, an undergraduate student, you may be wondering, how am I ever going to end up where I want to be? Um, and I can assure you that um, we've all been there, and you probably will end up somewhere, and you'll be happy that you're there. Um, so you'll see that I had kind of a circuitous path. So I'm actually from Texas originally, from between Austin and San Antonio. Um, I went to college on the East Coast in Massachusetts, and I majored in biology um, because I liked science. Um, but then I, you know, didn't really like being in a lab, and I didn't like being out in the cold collecting um, samples and that kind of thing. So I really was very unsure what I wanted to do when I graduated, and so I went back to. Austin and I worked um, in a bunch of different nonprofit organizations I worked for five years um, trying to figure out what I wanted to do and um, through that work I realized that one thing I was really interested in is that um, it was really obvious to me that health status and health outcomes differ a lot by um, across different groups of people um, in our country and I got excited about the idea that I could use data and information and um, and math to try to understand that better. So I went then to the University of California at Berkeley. I got a master's in public health in epidemiology and um, ended up staying and getting a PhD in epidemiology as well. Um, and the reason that I went that route is because as I was getting learning more about research, I realized that if I wanted to be the one to ask the research questions and decide what we were going to study, I needed that PhD. So that's what I did and then went back to Texas again. Um, and I did two more years of a research position um, at the University of Texas. And then I um, got my job here at Michigan State um, or down the road at Michigan State. So I've been here for about 10 years. You'll see from the map, I've lived on the East Coast and the West Coast and the Gulf Coast. And now I'm here on the in the Great Lakes coast. So it happens to be my favorite. So I'm happy to be here. Um, so my research is um, spans multiple different areas, but um, most of my work is kind of at the intersection of these areas. So I'm a social epidemiologist, which means that I study how social factors and social structures, including policies, impact health. I'm a perinatal epidemiologist, which means that I study pregnancy and um, infant health. And then um, I'm just really passionate in general about women's health across the lifespan and trying to understand how all these things come together. So I'm going to talk about that today. So we have three sort of learning objectives for tonight. So um, I'm just going to dive right in with the first one, which is defining and understanding the term health inequity. So you may have heard this, you may have heard about health disparities, um, and those are really two different things. So first of all, you're probably aware that um, health outcomes, diseases, or health states differ by different groups of people um, in the US and across the world. So this is just an example. This data is kind of old, but um, it's from 2009, but it's showing um, differences in mortality between men and women for different um, circulatory diseases and cancer. So you can see that men are represented by the lavender bars and have higher mortality for heart attack, stroke, um, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer compared to women. So that's a health difference. Um, this data is showing a different health difference. So this is data from more recently from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. This is showing crew, uh, cu excuse me, cumulative death rates. So adding up over time um, due to COVID-19 by race ethnicity. And you can see that um, at the kind of outset of the pandemic, um, you probably can't see the dates, but this is October, 2020. So you can see in 2020, um, death rates due to COVID were 
um, there were differences by race ethnicity, but they weren't substantial or they weren't as substantial as they got later. But starting in the winter of 2020 and 2021, you can see that the death rate for people who identify as indigenous um, really started to climb and is much higher now um, compared to other racial ethnic groups. Um, and that's followed by uh, people who are Pacific Islander, Black, white, Latino, and then um, Asian people have the lowest cumulative death rate due to COVID-19. Okay, so are these health inequities or health disparities? So first, a health disparity is simply a difference in health status of different groups of people. Those groups can be defined by race or ethnicity or disability status, um, sex, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, geography, income, education, occupation, anything really that um, groups people, you can see differences in health along many of those lines. So the first example that I showed you is a health disparity. There's a difference between men and women. But this is not a health inequity um, because in our society, men are not disadvantaged compared to women. So a health inequity is when those differences in health status are systematically associated with social disadvantage. So um, a health, you can think of a health inequity as kind of a double jeopardy where people who are already disadvantaged socially, economically, politically are also further disadvantaged in terms of health. Um, we sometimes also say that a health inequity is a health difference that's unjust or unfair. So the second example I gave you, um, if you were to compare crude death rates or excuse me, cumulative death rates to um, due to COVID-19 for indigenous people compared to white people in the US, um, that is a health inequity. We know that indigenous people have been um, historically oppressed and are currently socially disadvantaged compared to white people. And they also have higher death rates for um, COVID-19. Um, you can see health inequities in many different health outcomes um, and, it, and by many different characteristics here in the US. So this is just one of many, many examples. Um, this is data from a survey of non-elderly adults. Um, and you can see that, so there's three outcomes represented here. Um, people reporting that they have asthma, reporting that they were told by a doctor that they have diabetes or told by a doctor that they've had a heart attack or have heart disease. And you can see that again here for all of these, um, all of these health statuses, um, American Indian and Alaska Natives have the highest self-reported rates of these conditions. Um, and Black Americans also have high rates of, of asthma and diabetes. And so those would be more examples of health inequities. Um, if you, if any of you are from the Wayne County area or are familiar with Wayne County, um, there are very stark inequities in life expectancy in Wayne County. So if you look up in the um, northeast corner, um, these dark blue areas, these are zip codes. And those zip codes are like the gross point area. So life expectancy in that area is 82 years. Um, I know, error, 81, 82 years. And you can see that there are other zip codes right next door where life expectancy is 70 to 71 years. So 10 years difference in terms of life expectancy just due to zip code. So in my research, I study health inequities, inequities in maternal and infant health primarily in the US. Um, and so you're, you may be aware um, that in the US, there are, are measures of maternal and infant health are worse often compared to many other high income countries. Um, so this graph or this map is showing um, the percent of infants that are born preterm by country. So preterm babies are um, babies that are born less than 36 completed weeks of pregnancy. And those babies are um, on average at increased risk of vision problems, hearing problems, respiratory um, problems, developmental delays, et cetera, and preterm delivery as a risk factor for infant mortality. So it's an outcome that we're concerned about and that we measure. And you can see that the darker the orange, the country, the higher the um, prevalence of preterm delivery. So in the US, a little over 10% of babies are born preterm every year. And that is obviously much higher than Canada, Mexico, 
most countries in South America, Europe, China, Japan, Australia, et cetera. Even more concerning is that we also have these substantial race inequities within the US um, in terms of maternal and infant health. So this graph is showing a, slight, a somewhat or a slightly different measure. So this is the percent of infants that are born low weight. Um, that's um, less than uh, 2,500 grams or about five and a half pounds. And so you can see this is data from uh, 1970 to 2010, so 30 years of data. And you can clearly see that infants born to black mothers are much more likely, about twice as likely to be born low weight compared to white and Hispanic, um, infants born to white and Hispanic in, uh, mothers. And so what's especially concerning about this is that you see that the, the inequity here is about um, two times. So uh, infants born to black moms are about twice as likely to be born low birth weight in 1970 and um, almost two times as likely in uh, whatever year this was, which was probably about 2015. So that, that gap has not really changed over time. We're really not making any progress on this. <laughs> Um, so this is some, um, I'm going to show you some data from uh, one of my research studies that is um, along these same lines. So in this study, we were looking at preterm delivery and um, in between about 2006 and 2012, preterm delivery was actually declining in the US. So that was a good thing. Um, unfortunately, that's not happening anymore. But um, what we were looking at was race different, race and ethnic differences in that decline. So here you can see that for all the racial and ethnic groups we looked at, there was a decline in preterm delivery over this time period. Um, but those declines were not the same. So um, Black, Asian, Pacific Islander, and white moms had declines in preterm delivery of around 11-12%. Um, but Alaska Indian and, uh, or excuse me, American Indian and Alaska Native moms only had a decline of less than 1%, and Hispanic moms had a decline of about 5%. So although the outcome was getting better for everyone, it was not getting as much better for those groups. We also see inequities not just in outcomes of infants, but of mothers as well. Um, and I'll just briefly say here that um, we try to use gender neutral language when we talk about pregnant people and people who've given birth. Um, but sometimes I also use a more casual term, which is moms. Um, but it's important to note that not everyone who gives birth or is pregnant identifies as a woman or a mother. So I'll go back and forth between that terminology. Um, so here, this is some data from the Centers for Disease Control looking at what's called pregnancy related deaths. These are deaths during pregnancy or the first year after the end of a pregnancy that are either due to or exacerbated by pregnancy. So the causes are often hemorrhage, um, stroke, sepsis or infection, um, cardiovascular events, et cetera, hypertension. So you can see here that for every 13 um, white women who die during pregnancy or postpartum due to these causes, 30 American Indian or Alaska Native women die and 41 Black women die. So again, really substantial inequities there. Um, <clears throat> in my research group, one of the things that we are trying to measure are pregnancy-associated deaths. So these are deaths that also occur during pregnancy or the first year after pregnancy, but um, don't have to be within those sort of like obstetric causes that I just mentioned. So these deaths include deaths due to drug overdose, suicide, homicide, car accidents, et cetera. Um, so this is some kind of preliminary data from 2020. Um, this is looking at deaths during pregnancy or the first year postpartum due to drug overdose. And you can see that um, American Indian and Alaska Native moms are much more likely to um, die of drug overdose compared to other groups. Um, when we look at homicide, we see that Black moms are most likely to die of homicide during this time period. And all of these deaths, drug-related deaths and homicides, are um, increasing quite substantially. <clears throat> so this is, um, this is kind of one of my areas of focus. I'm not going to talk as much about that today. 
Um, but we know that these types of deaths are a concern during pregnancy and postpartum, um, and we're trying to understand more about that. <clears throat> so um, now that we've understood and defined what a health inequity is, we're gonna talk a little bit about why I focus so much on pregnancy um, and maternal and infant health. And the reason is because I think of pregnancy as kind of a window into the life course of both the pregnant person and the offspring, which are the next, you know, our next generation. So if you think about um, health as being something that, you know, is good, so you want it to be higher, and then you can think about, you know, the lifespan as being across time. If you imagine that there's a pregnant person who has, you know, above average health, and they may be likely to have an infant with um, above average health, that translates into typically, or on average, it translates into better health across the life course. So um, being born, you know, not preterm and higher birth weight is associated with lower risk of um, developmental delays and uh, childhood illnesses. It's associated with better educational attainment, um, it's associated with better cardiovascular health and lower risk of diabetes later in life, and ultimately with a longer lifespan. On the other hand, if you have a pregnant person with lower than average health and a baby that's born um, too early or too small, those things can kind of um, you know, reverberate across the lifespan so that um, that inequity that was there during pregnancy or at the time of birth is made even larger by the time, you know, that this generation has reached the end of its life. Um, the, the healthier pregnancy and healthier baby leads to a healthier person with a longer lifespan on average. So um, as I just noted, the health during pregnancy is related to health of the offspring through their life. But it's also important to remember that pregnancy is just a little um, segment of the whole life of the pregnant person. Nine months is not, or 10 months is not very much of this person's life. And so a major gap in the approach that we've typically taken is that when we try to improve pregnancy health or improve infant health, we focus just on that nine months. But um, we're increasingly realizing that we need to be thinking about that person's entire life. So their exposures and experiences when they were in utero, when they were an infant, a child, um, and up until the time that they got pregnant, what were those um, you know, environmental exposures, healthcare access, health behaviors? How did their experiences contribute to the health that they arrive at pregnancy with? Um, and so this is one of the ways that we think of pregnancy as being kind of a window into the life of the pregnant person. Um, we also know that risks that arise during pregnancy, pregnancy complications, um, or mental health um, issues that arise during pregnancy are strongly associated with the health of the pregnant person going forward for the rest of their life. So we can also think of pregnancy as kind of a window to the rest of the life of the pregnant person. So when I use this terminology, pregnancy as a window, it's a window into the early life exposures of the pregnant person. It's a window into the long-term health of the pregnant person. It's a window into the long-term health of the next generation. And it's also a window of opportunity. So that's really where um, you know, the, the excitement is, I think, is that pregnancy is a window of time when um, people are actually highly engaged with the healthcare system more so than any other time probably in life, um, except maybe the end of life. So um, well over 90% of people who are, give birth in the US have at least one visit with a, with a healthcare provider. So this is really an opportunity um, to identify people who are at risk to, um, and to also think about policies and programs that can, can help pregnant people um, and then therefore reduce those inequities and improve the health and reduce inequities going forward for that next generation. <clears throat> so in order to do this, we need to be able to understand what is driving those inequities that I talked about before, um, especially those racial inequities that I showed you, you know, have not, we haven't made any progress on those for 30 years. 
So um, some of the research that my, my research team does tries to address this. So I'm first, I'm gonna show you some research from um, a recent undergrad who was at Michigan State, um, who's now getting a master's in public health at the University of Washington and one of my recent PhD graduates and myself. So in this study, we were looking at race differences in preterm delivery, um, but we were focused on people with a college degree or greater. And we were using data from birth certificates, which means we have almost every birth in the US from, um, and this data was from 2015 and 2016. So the reason that we focused on people with a college degree is that we know that socioeconomic status is um, one factor that contributes to preterm delivery. And it's also um, associated with race in our country. So we were, wanted to try to eliminate that as, you know, a difference between race groups. So um, <clears throat> what we found when we did this study is that we found that um, non-Hispanic Black uh, birthing people or mothers were, ha had about 11% of their babies born preterm compared to only six and a half percent for white mothers. Um, and so if you divide 11.4 by 6.5, you get 1.8. In epidemiology, we like to use these risk ratios. And so you can interpret that by saying that um, babies born to black people are 80% are at an 80% higher risk or 80% more likely to be born preterm compared to babies born to white people. And again, this is just among mothers with a college education or more. So then we wanted to try to figure out, okay, well, what, what else can we, um, you know, what else could be causing this difference? So we looked at these, this data and we found as many fa risk factors for preterm delivery as we could. And we accounted for those. So we uh, accounted for age, marital status, parity, which is how many babies the person already had, um, prenatal care, smoking, pregnancy weight gain, pregnancy complications, which are like preeclampsia or hypertension, pre-pregnancy smoking, pre-pregnancy body weight, and pre-pregnancy hypertension and diabetes. So we tried to adjust for everything that we could think of. And when we did that, we found that that risk ratio was still 1.5. So what that tells us is that even after accounting for all of those things, babies born to non-Hispanic black people are still at a 50% higher risk of preterm compared to those born to white people. <clears throat> and again, this is only among mothers with a college education. So what this shows us is that that black white inequity is not being explained by socioeconomic status or age or healthcare um, or health behaviors or chronic conditions, at least as far as during pregnancy and right before pregnancy. So what else is explaining this inequity? Well, um, when we see a disease or a health outcome as an epidemiologist or as a doctor or probably just as a human, you start to try to think, well, what caused that, right? So you might think, what were the risk factors? Why does that person have that disease or that condition? Um, you might think about their physical environment. Were they exposed to some kind of pollution or um, lead? Were, wh what about their health care? Did they have access to health care? Was it quality health care? Um, what about their health behaviors? Did they smoke or what was their diet? Or you might try to think about um, you know, factors like violence or exposure to abuse. Um, and so this is often what we do. You know, we try to think about like, what are the health, health, what are the risk factors for these health outcomes? And, you know, how can this explain these inequities? But what we often don't think about are that there are really these root causes of these risk factors. So some people call these fundamental causes, you can call them root causes or whatever you want. But um, this is things like socioeconomic inequity. Um, racism, discrimination, sexism, et cetera. And so because the, the, so these fundamental causes, the important thing is that they are really inequitable social structures. So our society is not equal and that leads to an inequitable distribution of those risk factors. So um, instead of thinking about, well, why, you know, did, was that person exposed to, you know, pollution? 
we're thinking about why is this group of people more likely to be exposed to pollution than this other group of people. And so this is one of the ways that we try to think about health inequities. We think about how inequitable social structures lead to an inequitable distribution of risk factors and how that may lead to health inequities. So the important thing here um, is that if we, we often think that we should focus on intervening on those risk factors. So, um, you know, if you were a doctor or a nurse, you might, you know, try to encourage a person to have better health behaviors, like eat better, stop smoking. Um, as public health people, we often try to, you know, design interventions to um, increase people's, you know, access to health care or to, you know, we might try to um, improve, you know, quality of care or something like that. But because of these fundamental causes, when we intervene on these risk factors, we might be able to get one to go away. But because of these um, inequitable social structures, if another risk factor comes along, or let's say there's a medical advance, um, people who are more privileged are always going to, you know, be able to take advantage of those medical advances or public health advances or interventions. And people who are less privileged are always going to end up being more exposed to the negative risk factors. Um, so it, it kind of becomes this like a game of whack-a-mole where you're always trying to get rid of the risk factors. And then when another risk factor comes up, it again, there's an inequity. So the best way to explain this is kind of an example. So in the early 20th century, um, there was, you know, poor public sanitation in the U.S. and, and most of the world. Um, so this top picture shows a picture. I'm not sure where it's from, but you can see these kids are playing in what's probably like an open sewer. Um, there's a dead animal in the street. In the back, you can't really see it, but there's horse-drawn carriages, I think, and there's, you know, probably horses are defecating in the street. Um, and these conditions were especially bad in neighborhoods um, that were lower income and where people were more, you know, had crowd, uh, more crowded housing and worse conditions. Um, and so throughout the 20th century, there were lots of efforts to improve things. So this bottom picture is a group of people who are cleaning up a street. Um, there, were there were improvements in, you know, cleaning up, um, not having dead animals in the street, um, enclosing sewage systems, separating them from drinking water so that people have clean water. And so in 1964, um, there was a, a paper published in a journal called Sociological Inquiry. And this person said that as countries advance in their standard of living, as public sanitation improves, as mass immunization proceeds, and as Dr. Spock becomes even widely read, so Dr. Spock is a parenting manual from the 1960s, um, he, he thought that the, the factors which intervene between social classes and exposure to disease will become more and more equal for all social classes. So he predicted that as we were able to clean up the streets and provide clean water and get people vaccinated um, and get everyone parenting as instructed by Dr. Spock, that outcomes and health between social classes would become equal and we would no longer have health inequities. So um, do, do people think that that happened? No. <laughs> so you're probably well aware that we still have health inequities. I showed you a lot of them um, and they still are along the lines of factors like so social class, neighborhood and, and race and ethnicity. So the reason that this happened is because um, this is what this person thought was going to happen. So he thought, okay, there's socioeconomic inequity. Um, it's leading to differences in these risk factors like unsanitary conditions, clean water, et cetera. Um, and it's leading to health inequities. But if we can get rid of those, then we'll break that cycle. But what happens is that new risk factors come along. So um, a great example is smoking. At, um, prior to about 1950, the people who most people who smoked were, you know, well educated, high income doctors were notorious smokers. Um, and as we gained more knowledge about the fact that smoking is bad for your health, um, 
people with more power and more privilege and more knowledge and more resources quit smoking. Um, they're able to take advantage of resources to quit smoking, um, or they had, you know, other, um, they had the information to quit smoking. And the relationship between social, social class and smoking changed so that um, now, and, you know, after we found out that smoking was bad for your health, smoking became something that people with that people who had less privilege and less power and less wealth and income were more likely to do. So every time that we're able to eliminate one of these risk factors, something else comes along. Um, so we can think of examples. I mentioned smoking, um, lead contamination is, you know, now we don't necessarily have sewage in our water, but we have contam lead contamination. Um, other things like healthcare access. So as healthcare gets better at treating diseases, um, people with more power and privilege and who are better able to take advantage of those healthcare advantages or healthcare um, advances are more likely to use them, um, you know, are more likely to get the latest treatment. And so these inequities continue to persist because we can intervene on those risk factors but we're not really addressing those fundamental causes. So um, another fundamental cause that's important to mention is uh, structural racism. And so um, a lot of the inequities that I showed you in my, in my examples were um, race and ethnic inequities. So this is something that was recently put out by the American Heart Association. Um, and it's showing how the history of, um, in our country, the history of slavery has propagated down to create um, a structures that are um, structurally structures that are racist and that contribute to inequitable distribution of resources by race. So they taught, so they show how, um, sorry, race slavery led to um, things like Jim Crow laws, segregation, redlining, racial bias in the justice system, which has contributed to um, inequitable distribution of things like access to health care, housing, education, et cetera, and then how that has contributed to differences in cardiovascular risk factors and ultimately to um, worse cardiovascular and stroke outcomes for Black Americans. You could make a similar um, diagram of um, structural racism or discrimination or structural sexism for different um, historically oppressed or marginalized groups. So um, you're probably at this point like, okay, I'm depressed because you're showing me that, you know, I can't just intervene on um, smoking or I can't just like clean up, you know, lead in the pipes and fix all of these problems. So um, it is depressing and, um, and, and frustrating and, and um, unacceptable. But I think that there are also opportunities. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I view pregnancy and uh, maternal and infant health as, as one of these opportunities. So when we think about this fundamental cause um, framework, we can think about how there's different ways to sort of intervene or improve. So if, if for a person who's in a healthcare setting, a doctor, a nurse, physical therapist, et cetera, um, your role is really on this area kind of mitigating. So people are coming in, they're already sick or they already have a health problem and you're helping them. Um, and that is, you know, um, and certainly a great thing and admirable. We can also think about the role of, of more like public health where we're trying to address those risk factors and prevent um, poor health outcomes. And then we can think about how the, how the um, important, one of the most important things we can do is to try to really undo these inequitable social structures. Um, and we all know that that's not something one person can do, but there are, there are ways that we can, you know, think about how we can try to, um, try to address some of these um, structural inequities. And so one of the areas that my research group is working in is trying to identify um, public policies that we think might reduce some of these inequities and try to understand how they're impacting maternal and infant health. So one of those examples um, from our recent work is looking at the Affordable Care Act, um, Obamacare, 
you probably are kind of familiar with it. There are many different parts of the Affordable Care Act. Um, I just have a few listed here. These are parts of the Affordable Care Act that we hypothesized at the outset of our research, which really started um, five or seven years ago. We hypothesized that some of these parts of the Affordable Care Act might improve the health of people who are either um, before they get pregnant, during pregnancy, or in the postpartum period. So um, we were interested in the dependent care provision, which was the part of the ACA that allowed um, young people to stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26. Many of you are probably benefiting from that. Um, we looked at the preventative care mandate, which that was the part of the Affordable Care Act that required um, that most insurance cover um, preventive care, including contraception and contraceptive services without cost sharing. And then we looked at the way that the Affordable Care Act expanded insurance options um, through the marketplace, which is where people can purchase subsidized insurance and through Medicaid expansion, which is um, public insurance for lowest income Americans. So um, unfortunately, because of time, I don't have time to go into you know, all of the work that we've done but we've looked at, um, our, our initial work looked at women of reproductive age, and we found that Medicaid expansion did improve um, insurance coverage and access to care. Um, we also looked at the contraceptive mandate, and we found some positive impacts on use of long-acting uh, reversible contraception and unintended pregnancy. We actually haven't found strong impacts of Medicaid expansion on the like preterm birth and the birth outcomes that I talked about um, or pregnancy health measures, but we did find um, positive impacts on um, pre-pregnancy screening for depressive symptoms and self-reported depressive symptoms. And so one of, but one of the things that we've sort of um, in those studies, what we did is we sort of just looked at the impacts of these parts of the Affordable Care Act on health outcomes on average for everyone. And we are now moving to really focus on trying to understand how the Affordable Care Act and other policies impact those inequities that I've been talking about. So if you think about um, a public policy and how it impacts a health outcome. So this is an example where on your y-axis going up, you have some adverse health outcomes. So higher is worse. So that could be like preterm delivery, more of it is worse. And then on your x-axis, you have time. And where you see the dotted line is where a policy goes into place. You have two groups here. The light green on the bottom is a more privileged group. That could be the privilege due to socioeconomic status, race, et cetera. And the darker green line is a less privileged group. And you can see that both groups, the outcome is getting worse before the policy comes along. This is just theoretical, this is not real data. And then after the policy comes along, both groups start to get better. So that seems good, right? Everyone's um, you know, preterm delivery is getting better. But what's not happening is the difference between those groups is not getting smaller. So the policy is improving health, but it's not reducing the, that inequity. So what we're really looking for um, are policies that actually um, help the less privileged group, the top dark green line, more so that those lines get closer together. We still would like for policies to help everyone, but what we're really trying to um, understand is which policies reduce those inequities so that the two groups are closer together. So I'll show you briefly um, some findings from my recent PhD student who, this is her dissertation. She's, um, this is preliminary. She's working on publishing it. So her work was focused on unintended pregnancy um, among people eligible for that dependent coverage provision. So young people who might be able to stay on their parents' insurance rather than losing insurance. And so she, um, looked at difference changes in unintended pregnancy by uh, race ethnicity across time. And so this is the time period when the dependent coverage provision went into place in 2010. And you can see that unintended pregnancy declined for all groups, but the largest declines were among the, the top line, which is non-Hispanic black um, women 
and the next dotted line, Hispanic women. And so you can see that this is an example of this, at least preliminarily, her research shows that this policy seemed to reduce the inequity between these different groups in terms of unintended pregnancy. Um, so our, our research group is really, um, you know, this is something that we're continuing to work on. And what we're hoping is that we will continue to research various policies, um, social policies, health policies that address those fundamental causes, either prior to pregnancy or during pregnancy, um, with the hope of identifying which policies are best at eliminating or reducing, but ideally eliminating inequities in pregnancy, health, and birth outcomes, and ultimately in long-term health of pregnant people and um, the next generation. So this is kind of the overview of um, the direction that we're going. If you think that sounds exciting, <laughs> you can um, potentially join us or you can also uh, join other folks in our department. We have graduate programs in epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, lots of interesting research going on. Um, we have people studying environmental health and um, neurodegenerative health like Alzheimer's. We have folks doing drug dependence epidemiology. Um, we have, our, our program is very small. And so students get a really hands-on experience um, learning about epidemiology and biostatistics and doing research. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me or, or check out our website. Um, so just to wrap up, um, uh, the, the learning objectives that you're supposed to take away today, <laughs> hopefully you um, feel that you have learned the difference between a health disparity and a health inequity, and you understand what a health inequity is. Um, and if you don't, I'll repeat that it's a health difference where the difference is also um, along the lines of socioeconomic disadvantage, um, such that people who are already socially disadvantaged are also worse off in terms of health. Um, hopefully you've also understood how we can think of pregnancy as a window into the life course or the lifespan of both a pregnant person and the health of the offspring and next generation. And hopefully you also um, came away thinking that there are potentially some opportunities to think of pregnancy as a way or as an opportunity to reduce um, some of those health inequities that we talked about. Um, I'll just put up my thank yous to funders and collaborators and um, the students, postdocs, and staff in my lab, in my research group that make all of the work possible. And um, I think we have plenty of time for questions. I really appreciate your attention and um, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm also happy for you to contact me separately if you'd like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great question. So um, the question for people who are online is that, um, have we looked at um, deaths due to um, domestic violence or um, intimate partner violence? related to pregnancy and postpartum. So um, what the data that I showed was just homicides in general. And we the da that data is from death certificates. So we're not really able to determine the cause, but we, we know based on other research that most of those are from partners or you know, people that the person knows. It's not so much random violence. Um, we are in uh, um, some of our research, we are trying to look at what we're calling violent victimization. And in the, so this is people who are um, pregnant or postpartum who are showing up in the emergency department with evidence of um, violent victimization. And so we may be able to get more at it with that, but so it's, it's a tough, tough area because um, it's hard to get data. Yeah, great question. <laughs> yes. 
you know, in the same line of that, like, is there anything that you're doing to talk to, like, especially like, in the situation of like, public conversation? Is this there and like, kind of, there's like, a lot of information and knowledge? So, are you like, trying to find for that? Or yeah, um, that's definitely a, a great point. So um, her question was whether we were accounting for like under reporting or lack of information, especially for indigenous populations in terms of um, things like uh, um, intimate partner violence. So um, one, I guess, benefit of the research I do is that most of our data is pretty comprehensive, but it's it doesn't have a lot of deep information. So when we look at like death certificates, we do have all of them for everyone in the US. So we're not really missing people, but there still is under reporting because someone fills out that death certificate and it's not the person who died, obviously. It's, uh, it's usually like a coroner. And so they are making you know a choice about what they put as the cause of death. Um, and they're also required to indicate whether the person was, if they're pregnant, it's likely that they do indicate that accurately, but it's unlikely that they, or it's often missed if they, you know, are six months or eight months postpartum. So um, they have to like check a box to indicate that. And um, there's very little research trying to validate that, but what there is shows that it's, you know, many of these like postpartum deaths are not recorded as postpartum. And then um, the other project that I was talking about where we're looking at emergency department visits, it's also pretty comprehensive. That's only data from California, but we do have like almost every emergency department visit in California. But of course we don't have people who don't go to the emergency department. So that's we think of, um, especially with this, the pregnancy and postpartum mortality, it's like an iceberg where deaths are the very tip, emergency department visits are the next kind of layer, and then there's most likely a humongous iceberg underneath of suffering and morbidity from violence, um, you know, substance use, self-harm, mental health, et cetera. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question also. So um, the question was whether it's possible to separate out um, outcomes that are more likely to be directly influenced by social causes, such as implicit bias by healthcare providers. Is that yeah. kind of what you're saying? Um, yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I don't know if I've thought enough to have a really good answer, <laughs> but certainly um, there are some health outcomes that are more random. Um, so an example is um, like pancreatic cancer. It's not strongly patterned by social factors. So there was one of the very first studies that really looked at like social differences in health um, was looking at education differences in a bunch of different um, causes of mortality. And so they show that there's this very clear like gradient or like a stair step with higher mortality for lower educational groups due to almost everything. But there are these things like pancreatic cancer that don't show those patterns. So um, I don't know if that's kind of what you were thinking of, but it is possible to sort of like distinguish um, different types of health outcomes and think about, um, you know, yeah, I also showed that um, it was the graph where it was showing like the self different self-reported health outcomes by race, ethnicity. And you can see that like every health outcome is not patterned in exactly the same way. So when we wanna try to understand, it's important to look at those like, well, there are some outcomes that where there's less inequity than others. And we might think that those where there's more inequity is where there's more of these structural factors or maybe they're more influenced by biased healthcare providers, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. First one is Michigan is one of six states that doesn't offer Medicaid benefits to patients with type two diabetes. 
can be helped by these two persons to use glucose monitoring devices. The device is often impactful to include elements of field and current health. Is there a coalition working to impact state level HHS policy for CPM use for patients with type 2 diabetes? Yeah, so um, the question, should I repeat the question? Okay, yeah, so <laughs> the, the question um, was, or the, the person stated that Michigan is one of a few states that doesn't offer, I think, Medicaid coverage for people with type 2 diabetes, and that could um, limit options for treatment for people during pregnancy. So, and, and is there anything being done about that? Um, I have to say, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I it wasn't actually even aware of that, but um, it does sound like a problem. <laughs> Uh, it seems improving policies to reduce health inequities rarely, if at all, negatively impact the health provision for the privileged. So why is there still such a major gap between the privileged and the less privileged? Um, okay, so the question was, it, see, it seems that health policies don't usually negatively impact more privileged groups. Um, so that is true and that's because of kind of that fundamental cause thing that i talked about so if there's a policy so a great example of this is that um, in 2021 um, many many parents re started receiving checks in july for their like advance payments on the tax credit that you get if you have children normally you get it when you file your taxes but they greatly increased the tax credit and anyone who had filed taxes the year before just automatically started getting these advanced payments. Those, if you look at who got those payments, who reports getting those payments, the lowest income people didn't get the payments because they had not filed taxes the year before, or maybe because they had moved or weren't aware of something they needed to do to get those payments. So it's a policy that's supposed to help everyone. And it's actually supposed to help people with lower income more because you get more money per kid. But it ended up that the more privileged group was more likely to benefit from the policy. Um, so I think the question was, why haven't those inequities closed? But I think the question actually kind of answers itself because more, because more privileged groups typically benefit from policies more. What we see is those lines you know, if it's if it's something beneficial, both lines go up, but the more privileged line goes up more. And so sometimes health policies or social policies that are designed to help people actually make inequities worse. Um, but we often don't really measure that or report on it. Yeah. Yeah, one more on, okay. When thinking about clinical applications of your research, have you identified these interventions as the greatest possible Mm. <laughs> well, I guess I can't really speak. Okay, the question was, um, are there clinical interventions that have had the greatest impacts on mortality? Um, I probably shouldn't speak to mortality in general. Um, I can make some guesses um, of, you know, I think if we look back through history, um, we know that things like vaccines and treatment for um, heart disease has made big impacts on mortality. But I think in the, in the more my um, realm of, of like pregnancy related mortality, um, what I would say is that we're just starting to really, I think gain some traction on identifying and testing potential interventions. So, um, many of you probably heard in the media that, you know, maternal mortality is higher in the U.S. than many other countries. It's been getting worse instead of getting better. And there is a lot of research being done to try to understand what we can do there. And a lot of research, uh, excuse me, a lot of funding for um, trying out different interventions. So I don't think we know yet, but I do feel like there's, um, there's, you know, interest and there's motivation in that area. Um, one of the main things that people are trying to work on is having doctors listen more to um, pregnant and postpartum women. We know that lots of people um, have a baby, go home and experience 
you know, really um, strong, so like really debilitating symptoms, headaches and bleeding, um, but often aren't able to get the care they need really quickly because the providers don't, you know, don't believe that that's happening or they send them home. So I think that's like an area within at least my realm where we really could save lives quickly by paying more attention to, you know, to postpartum women. If we had one more question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So the question was, after a policy goes into place, how quickly can you look at the impacts of it? So there's two challenges. <laughs> the first is data, because when we're trying to measure, especially health outcomes, that data doesn't appear instantaneously. <laughs> so the data sets that I use, which um, are primarily birth certificates, death certificates, and then these large national surveys, um, they take a while. So I don't, I'm not able to get like birth certificate data for over a year. Um, and more and death certificate data takes even longer. And the survey data, you know, it's several years. So if a policy goes into place, um, there's not a lot of real time data to measure the impacts. The second part, which I think is what you were getting at, is it takes a while for things to change. Um, and so that's a question that um, actually we're kind of trying to grapple with. So you wouldn't expect, you know, let's say the Affordable Care Act goes into place or um, Medicaid um, is expanded to low income people. So first of all, every eligible person doesn't immediately sign up and get, start getting their benefits. And then even if they do, people can't automatically, you know, get in to get the care they need, or perhaps, you know, most of most of the health um, issues that we have that are you know, really prevalent today, take a while to treat. Um, you know, chronic illness, um, mental health, those, those aren't things that change immediately. So I don't have an answer to your question, but it's a, it's a great question and one that we're trying to understand, like how do we even, where do we start measuring? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Another great question. So the question was, as an example of a policy that recently changed, um, as of January 1st, Medicaid in Michigan is covering doula services for um, Medicaid covered people. So that's like a birth assistant that is a non, um, is not a doctor or nurse. It's a person who's trained in providing support for the pregnant person um, and postpartum. So um, so how, and then the, the, the question was, how would we measure that? Because we actually don't really have like on the birth certificate, it doesn't ask, did you have a doula? So um, this is another challenge that we face is often we don't have the information we need on who was eligible for a policy or who used it. So um, uh, Medicaid is actually also an example because people are eligible based on their income, but we don't know what their income is. <laughs> so, or the, the child tax credit, for example, we have health data sets, but they don't usually ask questions about, you know, did you get this benefit or that benefit? So there's two things, two approaches that we take. One is that we do make our, like our best guesses. So sometimes we go to another data set. If we have another data set that gives us more detailed information about who's eligible for different benefits, we can look at the characteristics of those people 
and then kind of calculate like, okay, a person who's, you know, 20 to 25 and unmarried and lives in this area is more likely to be eligible for a specific policy than someone who's 40 and, you know, lives in this area. So sometimes we make those kind of guesses. Um, it's obviously not perfect. <laughs> Um, another approach is that with data sets that are surveys, sometimes we can add questions to them. So, um, you know, I don't know that if there's, if this is going to happen, but there is a postpartum survey that's um, done in most states, including Michigan called PRAMS, where a sample of people who give birth every year is sent a survey to ask them a bunch of questions about um, their pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, and postpartum health. So that would be an example of where we could, I don't know if I could, but people could add a question about whether you used a doula to that survey. And that would be ideal. That would be the best way to, to get at that, but it will take time. <laughs> All right, that. Oh, yep, I don't wanna walk off with it. <laughs> so with that, uh, why don't you help me thank uh, Dr. Margerison one more time for her presentation. Thank you again to our co-sponsors, uh, Hope College and uh, Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. And uh, thank you all for coming. You're a great audience, great questions, and have a good night.